Hello, everybody. It's about time. I'm very happy to chair the third of the PMIP uh, uh, Wings seminar. Uh, today we have two speakers. Um, the plan is the uh, we have a 20 minutes talk followed by 10 minutes discussion and then the uh, second talk for 20 minutes followed by uh, another 10 minutes discussion. And I will keep the Zoom uh, open after one hour. So if the speakers and the audience wants to continue discussions, that will be fine. And uh, so um, let's uh, start. The, the first uh, speaker is the um, Sizzling Ho from the National Taiwan University uh, Assistance Professor. And uh, she's going to talk uh, about latitudinal patterns of upper ocean temperature. Are they proxy dependent? Please, Ling. Can you hear me? Yeah. OK, perfect. So thank you for the introduction. So as uh, Masaka just said, I'm uh, Ling from National Taiwan University. Um, so I thought that there would be a lot of model people here today. So I'm going to uh, do a bit of introduction about proxy and then show you my results. So as you can tell from the title of the talk today, I'm going to talk to you about proxy derived temperature data sets. So this will be coming from two different uh, time intervals, Pliocene and also last glacial maximum. So the Pliocene result I'm showing here is published. So this is the work done by the Pliovar working group. So this is a group uh, had led by uh, Aaron McClemont. Uh, helped a bit by Hedrefort and myself. And then the LGM data set is coming from my own group. So this is uh, ongoing work by my students and also postdocs together with our collaborator. So uh, before I dive into the results, just some quick introduction to proxy. So I'm sure many of you here are familiar with these proxies. Um, just in short, these are uh, geochemical indicator that we use to reconstruct ocean temperature and they are analyzed from marine sediments, and they can be based on organic molecules or uh, the carbonate shells of um, microfossils. So both can be found in marine sediments. So example are UK37. Here you can see this is based on the lipids of algae, uh, or TEX86, which is based on the um, lipids of archaea. And you can also have trace elements like magnesium calcium and clump isotopes. They are measured on the shell of foraminifera. So foraminifera is a type of um, zooplankton that you tend to find a lot in the ocean. Uh, they look a bit like this here. And the principle of the proxy is really straightforward. So basically, we assume that the signal that is recorded by the signal carrier or the source organisms of the proxy, so for example, these guys here, uh, they are the carrier of all the signal here. Uh, so whatever signal you find or temperature signal that you record uh, in them is coming from the place where they live or their habitat. So if they are coming from mixed layer of the ocean, then the temperature that they record would be, of course, then coming from the mixed layer. So this is how we reconstruct uh, temperature of the ocean. And mixed layer temperature is also often uh, interpreted as sea surface temperature. So as you also know, uh, sea surface temperature or SST uh, this is often used for data model comparison. This is one example from the latest IPCC report. Uh, here you can see three key periods. You have Eocene. This is a very warm period with very high CO2. And in the middle, you have middle uh, mid Pliocene. So this is uh, also a warm period with high CO2. And then on the right hand side, you have uh, last glacial maximum. This is LGM, so low CO2 climate. And today I'm going to focus only on the mid Pliocene and also the LGM. So here you are looking at data model comparison. Dots are data, and then the background temperature field is model output. So as you can see here, uh, there are not so many data points, for example, for the mid Pliocene period. So this is already uh, all we can find, uh, global compilation based on whatever that is published in the literature. And now we are going to zoom into this data set. So this is basically the synthesis product of the uh, Pliovar uh, group led by Aaron McClemont. And here you can see temperature anom anomaly 
uh, based on this data set, uh, plotted uh, versus the latitude. And the proxy here uh, shown as this uh, blue symbols or orange symbol. So you have two proxies here. The blue one here, you can see these are based on UK and the orange one are based on minis and calcium. So this is the microfossil, the carbonate shells. And within the same color, you also see different symbols that is just indicating that these uh, estimates are calculated using different calibrations. And we also have here the model output from the Plyomid 2. So this is the range that you have for the Plyomid 2 model. Uh, so first thing you can see while, when staring at this plot is that comparing the pink lines or these vertical lines and also the blue one here, you see that they actually fit quite well together so that you can say that uh, there is some kind of model data agreement there uh, you, uh, based only on the blue symbols or the blue data. Now for the same uh, latitudinal range, you can see that wherever you have both uh, orange and also blue data, they don't always agree well with each other. And this gives rise to this very strange uh, uh, box here with data that are showing you Pliocene cooling. So because the temperature anomaly here is uh, minus. So it means that the Pliocene was cooler than now, than pre-industrial, according to this proxy data, the orange one. And this is all will persist if, if we use a different kind of calibration, for example, this Bayesian one. So this seems to be a proxy differences between the blue and the orange proxies. And as a result of that now, if you would use this data to calculate global mean SST anomaly. So here you have two lines here. You see the gray line and the yellow line. So the gray line here is the global mean calculated only using only the blue data. Then you get this temperature anomaly uh, of around 3.5. And now if you will use everything, you say, okay, I don't care. I mean, I want to use as many data as possible for my calculation. So I include also all these orange points here. Then you end up with this yellow line. So the yellow line is 2.5. So you see that temperature anomaly is off by one degree Celsius. So that means that uh, the choice of model seems to also affect a little bit your calculation of this global mean SST um, mean. Next, uh, if you do the data model comparison using the global mean temperature anomaly that we looked at before here versus uh, the change in the mirror gradient, and then compare it with the models, you can see that uh, all this color dots here, these are all models, and then the proxy is in black. So the model also show a huge range, right? From here to here. And now with the proxy, if you would use all the proxy, the orange and also the blue ones, you get this uh, square that is sitting in the middle here. So here you will say, okay, uh, there is some kind of uh, data model comparison that the proxy is sitting right in the middle of this range of the model. But now if you say, okay, I don't want to use the orange one because they look a bit strange. They are showing uh, Pliocene cooling. So I only use the blue ones. So only UK37. Then you end up with these dots here. So this dots here means that you are far away from the cluster of your model output. And now if you use a different calibration for UK, which is the Bayesian one, then you move further away from the clusters. So with this one, you get a different result. You will say that, well, there is no change in the meridional gradient during the Pliocene. And this is quite different from what the models are showing. So in short, the proxy choice seems to be mattering for, for data model comparison. But of course, I mean, we want to know next what is causing this difference between the orange data and the blue data. So then uh, we try to look at the location of this data. Where do they come from in the ocean? You can see here the there are these uh, circles or so circles are one proxy and triangles are the other proxy. So within the latitudinal range where you see this uh, very uh, large discrepancy between the proxy, um, in fact, the data are coming not from the same location. They are even coming from different basin, right? So then it's really hard to tell if this uh, difference is due to the fact that they are different proxy or simply because they are um, look, recording a local signal at different locations, as you can tell here. So there is no reason to say that whatever is here should be the same as the one here, because they are really different, uh, located in different basins. So the only way to really look into this, I would argue, is to have more multi-proxy data. 
And unfortunately, in this global compilation that many people have helped over the years to, to complete, is um, having only one side with uh, two proxies. And at this one side, uh, well, the, the UK37 is showing you stronger plasma warming than anything calcium, but this is only one side. So it's a bit hard to tell if this really size specific or it's really true for the proxies. So that means that uh, we need to uh, go and look for other data set that will allow us to have more multi-proxy comparison. So uh, a good place to start to look into that is by looking into a more recent time period like uh, LGM. Because at least for the LGM, there are many more data points. As you can tell here, there are many more dots so at least it's a better spatial coverage compared to the Pliocene. So now let's zoom into the LGM data set. So this is uh, showing you by color different proxies. And this number is just the number of proxy uh, record that we have. So you see, we have a lot, hundreds, hundreds of um, proxy data from the LGM ocean. But uh, a bit surprisingly, I mean, for me at least is that Despite this huge number of data, we actually have very few sites with um, more than two proxies. So for example, out of these hundreds of data points, only two locations has three proxies. And then there are a few more that have uh, a combination of, of two proxies. So that means that if you want to rely on compiled data set to look into a uh, proxy discrepancy or how uh, proxy compare to each other, it is uh, not so easy. So it means that this ask or this basically then say or tell us that we need to do something uh, ourselves, so DIY. And this is what we try to do. But of course, this is really time consuming and resource consuming, and therefore we start small. And also we try to use a strategy that uh, combine uh, published data with new data. So we basically look for a few sites that uh, people have published some data, and then we try to complete the multi-proxy data set by generating data that are still missing for that site. So by doing so, we end up with this uh, regional data set. So the dots here tells you the location of the, the records. And uh, what we want for this data set is that we want to have at least three proxies for all the sites. So UK text and also uh, magnesium calcium uh, based on foraminifera. And for this one, we also look at multiple species just to get as, many, as much information as possible from, from the same sediment core. So you can see also here that the locations of the site are also spanning uh, quite a large variety of the hydrography and also um, different uh, seasonality. So for example, this color here indicates the seasonality of surface temperature or, or SST. So here you have very small seasonality compared to here you have really large seasonality. So it basically uh, spans uh, very uh, different hydrographies. So the hope is that we cover everything and this way we can see uh, the largest possible uh, behavior of all the proxies in different uh, hydrographies. So next I will show you the result. So this is the result. So as I said, we have eight sites and then for each site we have three SST proxies. So the proxies are, um, this is uh, indicated by the colors. You have UK, tax, and magnesium calcium. So if you look at this for a few moments, I think it is quite clear that the first thing is that all of the proxies shows lower temperature during LGM, which is this part here, uh, and warmer temperature during Holocene, which is this part here, so for all the sites. So that is good, because this is what you would expect. Um, but then if you zoom in, and look at it for a few more seconds, you realize that then they are actually really different from each other in terms of the uh, the temporal evolution uh, and also the magnitude of change. So this one here is quite similar, of course, but some other one like this one here is showing you very different magnitude of cooling. And also this one here is showing you very different magnitude of cooling. So this uh, kinds of tell you that even though they are coming from the same side, even though they are supposed to uh, record SST, uh, even though we merge them for to make a global compilation, assuming they are the same thing, they are not always showing the same thing. So that is what we can con uh, conclude from that. So moving on, I'm going to then calculate LGM cooling based on the eight sites that I showed before, based on this time series. So now the, the cooling is just calculated as the difference between two time slices. We have LGM time slice, uh, 19 to 23 kilo year, and also late Holocene time slice, zero to four kilo year. 
And then uh, on top of the three proxies that I showed you before, now I'm also to, going to add also model output. So this model output is based on the original ocean model, uh, SBPOM, Stony Brook um, parallel ocean model. So the payload data that I use to run this model is uh, coming from Miroc 4M. And this is published uh, uh, outputs. So first we look at the model. So when I say the model, I'm talking about the temperature, um, the algae cooling at the location of the proxy records. So therefore we have eight sites, so we have eight points. So here is a model output for the location of the proxy records. You see that uh, this is latitude uh, on, the, on, the, on the x axis. You see that um, there's a little bit of this uh, pattern going towards uh, stronger cooling in uh, higher latitudes. And this is also consistent with what we know about the uh, latitudinal pattern of, of uh, LGM cooling. So it's all good. And now we slowly we plot the data. So first we start with UK37, and this is uh, showing um, a little bit of a pattern, but not very clear because of uh, very small differences in the LGM cooling. And for the magnesium calcium, it's uh, very stable throughout the sites. So throughout the latitude from, from uh, the equator all the way to the mid latitudes in the north. And then if you look at text, the blue ones here, you can see that they show this uh, very strong pattern of uh, increasing LGM cooling with uh, latitude. So there is a uh, yeah, interesting pattern there. So then if you look at the difference between the proxy, you, for example, you look at the difference between tax and, LG and UK in terms of the um, LGM cooling, you see that uh, you, the, you also see a bit of this pattern here, like it goes uh, a bit uh, stronger with latitude, with increasing latitude. Similarly, for the difference between tax and magnesium calcium, this is the black one here. But I think that just because as you can see here, this blue one here is moving like the gradient is really large. Therefore, it's per perhaps is driving the difference in the mismatch between the proxies. And then uh, also when you look at magnesium calcium and UK, you see not so much pattern, but they're just, you know, of course they don't agree all the time with each other. You see that they are scattering around here. So within a plus minus two degrees Celsius uh, difference. So this is interesting. So we want to understand further like what's going on here with this pattern, especially in the blue uh, uh, blue um, data. So for that, we zoom further into uh, this region here. So here you are marked by really strong seasonality. So this is a work by my student, uh, uh, Tina Lin. So what is really cool about this region is that you can see that the seasonality is really large in the gradient. So this is in summer. Summer, you have almost no gradient from north to south. And then in winter, you have a large gradient from uh, this uh, south to north. So you can also imagine now if your proxy is recording one season, you will in theory see this uh, gradient as well in the proxy records, if you have records along these latitudes, right? So in this study, we have these four sites uh, that we provide of three uh, multi-proxy um, data sets. So first we start with UK37. So here uh, it seems that, or uh, at least according to the modern day data, the, uh, the proxy is recording uh, annual mean temperature. So here you can see UK time series plotted against age, and then this is your LGM, this is late Holocene. And uh, you can see that there are this separation between the groups of time series. So you have a bit about three to five degrees Celsius of gradient from north to south. And this is uh, kind of consistent with the um, annual mean SST uh, gradient also in the region. So it seems to be, uh, yeah, at least uh, could be like annual mean SST as at least uh, based on the gradient. And then if you move on to the next one, magnesium and calcium, so based on modern day data here, we think that, or we know based on, uh, for example, sediment trap uh, data that they are recording summer temperature. So now if you look at the SST records um, based on this proxy, plotted against H again, you see that uh, unlike the previous uh, proxy, it shows no gradient at all, right? Between LGM also Holocene. So that is also again consistent with what we know about modern day summer temperature uh, gradient in this region based on World Ocean Atlas. So this is the climatology data. So all's good. Next we move on to tag. So this is a bit uh, interesting. 
because uh, based on modern data, it would seem that here it could record a bit deeper in the water column and perhaps uh, also bias towards one season. And if you now uh, look at the time series, you can see that it also developed these two, uh, the separation between two groups of time series, the southern part and also the northern part. And the gradient between the south and the north is large, so about seven degrees. I mean, that is at least, um, not really unrealistic because at least in modern day, in winter, you also get a large gradient. But in uh, LGM, it, also, it gets even larger, so it basically doubles. Uh, for the LGM to 15 or so. So this is uh, partly due to the strong cooling in the record. And uh, um, so we want to understand what could what could have caused such a strong glacial cooling at this northern side. So we look into the model output from SVPOM, which is this one here. So we just want to know if uh, the model can show whether uh, some uh, LGM cooling uh, of some season or some depth is particularly uh, strong that could explain this uh, very large glacial cooling at this northern site. So this is from the model, this color lines for different seasons. You have summer, winter, and anomine. And this is water depth. This is the magnitude of cooling. This is from the tax proxy. You can see that uh, none of the season nor uh, different depth could explain it because it's, yeah, of course, some in some season like this red line here shows, it could be uh, stronger at subsurface than the surface, but it never goes to above 10 degrees Celsius of glacial cooling. I mean, at least not in the model. So next we want to explore whether, I mean, at least in the model world, uh, whether this uh, strong cooling could come from uh, the proxy record different seasons or different depth during the LGM and the, and the Holocene. So to do that, we just look at the temperature of the time slice. So temperature of late Holocene, temperature of LGM. So this is from the proxy. This is from the model, the lines. So for the late Holocene, we see that um, the, the proxy actually uh, corresponded quite well with summer temperature at this depth, 35. So that is consistent with what we know from the modern day data. So that is really great. And for the LGM, um, yeah, I mean, to get at nine degrees, you need to go all the way down to uh, 145 meter. So that if the model is right, or if we can trust the uh, internal structure of the model, in, in terms of the temperature data, then this would suggest that there is a shift in the recording depth of the proxy uh, between the LA Holocene and also LGM. So um, I think uh, from all the results that I'm showing today, it is uh, clear. I mean, we don't really know like all the time what is the cause of these uh, different discrepancies, but suffice to say that based on the plots that I show, uh, I think we can all agree that um, different proxies, even when they are from the same side, they do not always show the same pattern, nor the magnitude of change. So this means that when we are trying to uh, merge them for global compilation to make, for example, some temperature field, we should be a bit careful about it. And uh, we also show that um, based on what we know about modern day latitudinal gradient, it would seem that proxy also can record pretty well or faithfully reflect seasonal temperature. So that is really powerful as I think uh, some paper has shown recently last year and the year before that uh, you can use it to reconstruct basically uh, seasonality in the past. So that is really great. So just uh, bring it, um, where can we go from here? So this is also to start some discussion uh, here in the seminar. So I think what we will really need or what could be really nice for us to further look into this is to have some kind of uh, eco-physiological models that are coupled with the AOGCM to simulate the, the depth or the seasonality of proxy carriers, then this will allow us to better compare between proxy and model. But to do such a, or to build such a solid um, or robust models, we need to also understand very well the physiology and also the ecology of the marine organisms that carry the signal of proxy. So we, I think we still then therefore need a bit more field studies uh, that will allow us to really look into that. Because so far, I think there are not so much information in the literature. And what could also be really nice is to have more multi-proxy records. And the reason for that is that first, not to just see if, whether they are the same, but I was hoping that if we can finally get enough spatial coverage of all these uh, multi-proxy records, 
uh, at least for, for the same time period, for example, for the LGM, then we could uh, start to look into whether we can extract some kind of spatial pattern in the difference between proxy, and this will allow us perhaps to to use it to correct temperature field based on a global compilation that is uh, done by merging everything. And the result, uh, the reason for that is because I think it is not possible in the end to build a truly multi-proxy uh, global compilation because it will take too much uh, effort and resources. And also sometimes it is not possible simply because of the material that either you don't find enough um, organic matter or you don't find enough uh, carbonate shell. So it's not always possible to do uh, multi-proxy even if you want to. So there must be, uh, or it would be good to have uh, some other way to uh, to kind of uh, understand what could be the potential error or potential uncertainty uh, associated with this kind of uh, merging of different proxy types in, in a compilation. So I would, I, I was actually hoping that with the seminar, we can start some uh, discussion about how we can do a more strategic community effort. Um, the, for example, starting an international working group to really try to uh, generate more multi-proxy records and also to do uh, inter-proxy comparison, a bit like a PMIM. I mean, but this time, for proxy and not for model. So with that, I will uh, thank you for your attention and uh, happy to, to discuss further and also to uh, answer some questions. Thank you very much, Link, um, for your insight, for uh, information into the data model comparison, which is important for PMIP community. I take a few questions. Okay. Somebody stop sharing. Um, Jill, you are uh, raising hand? Can yes, yes. Yep. Um, thanks to give me the opportunity. Uh, thanks for the, the, the seminar. It was really very clear. But at the end, I was a little bit um, astonished because at the beginning, you show on Plymid where we get a very few data that there were a real inconsistency, even on the, the way for, for some proxy it was decreasing and for other increasing. And then you, you go to LGM because you get much more proxies and you can do much better job to compare proxies, but you never come up to the first question. So so what is your what is your what is your what is your feeling to try to solve this problem? Uh, I just want to say that there is, if I understood if I understood well, two ways. One is to you kind of of straightforward analysis where you you try to 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 compare the results of model in with including seasonal changes with a proxy to try to investigate if they are reflecting a, a peculiar season. Another to trust the model and to trust the biology and to do a model which is able to know where is a foraminifer uh, in the column and when you are really uh, recording the temperature. This seems to me a very long-term perspective, but the first one I think is, 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 is possible. So I get two questions. I will come back to your first question about Plyosin, and the second one, what is your opinion on the way to go? Uh, I will go first to the second comment or the second question that you said about, uh, what was that again? The To have a model to simulate where they live in the water column. Yeah, that's exactly, uh, I think, the, the thing we should try to do now. I think some people are trying to do that, but it is really not so easy because we don't have a complete understanding of how they behave. So it's often really difficult to simulate it because I think that right now they are using the growth rate of the organism to try to simulate the abundance. So I'm not sure if this is really uh, robust enough yet, but I think there are a few groups of people who are trying to do that. And then for the second question about plyo, plyo sim one, uh, I go back to share my screen. I actually want to show some figures from the paper. We did do that, like you said, we compare with the season uh, here. Um, so you were asking about whether or not it could be just... Yes. Oh, there is some, this one. So yeah, we did try to do that, but this way we are mostly focusing on only in the North Atlantic. We want to see if um, we could uh, see whether these uh, outlier here, so this is the triangle one. 
it was plotted as orange in the other figure. You see that it's still below the blue symbols, right? So it seems that even the seasonal uh, range of the model, which is this one here, this uh, big uh, error bar here, does not uh, fully explain it. So it means that it has to be something else. I mean, we were not really sure what could be the reason, so we didn't discuss in the end, didn't give a really a solid uh, suggestion on what to, to say about this difference. So I think, yeah, we still do need to do a bit more work. I'm actually thinking that perhaps one of the possibility could do with the fact that we are now, because the temperature anomaly is calculated as the proxy for the KM5C minus pre-industrial. And this pre-industrial data is not proxy. It's coming from the data set as ERA5 SST, I think. So it's not really uh, comparing apples with apples in this case, because we are comparing proxy data with, with the uh, PI from uh, some, um, I think, uh, analysis data. So one way forward is perhaps we need to do systematically for all these uh, pliers in data, also modern day data at the location. This way we are comparing directly within the proxy space. So perhaps this will be uh, one way to see whether or not this is to do with also the uh, bias from the this calculation method that we are taking the difference between the proxy and the reanalysis data. So that is uh, my thoughts on that. Did I, under did I answer all the questions? That's two, right? Thank you very well. Thank you. Uh, I think... Hi, uh, Mary, uh, uh, Elliot, please. Uh, hopefully, yeah. good question. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. That was a really nice talk. I enjoyed it. And I really think this idea of comparing models and data is, is a great way forward and uh, particularly comparing all these different sets of data. Um, I, I had a question about the northern sites because when I looked at your figures, you know, the kind of um, that kind of uh, trip towards bigger differences at higher latitudes was really very uh, influenced by that one point. And uh, yeah. while you were talking, I was like, uh, where is that sediment core? And I was kind of looking at it, and it's it's off the Ryukyu Trench, eh? Yes. And so during LGM, that's a very particular kind of part of the world. Um, it's like there's kind of an, an, an internal sea there. So I don't know where it is with respect to the Ryukyu Trench. Let me show you again. Uh, it's uh, here in this low, northern part. Yeah, so it's inside. It's And so it could have... Some it could be influenced, but it's, it nearly becomes a, a closed sea at some point there, doesn't it? The uh, during yeah. the LG, I was yeah. wondering if that could have an influence on it or not on on the data that you're looking at. Um, um, yeah, so uh, I know that uh, some colleagues who is also here actually uh, Yamamoto San, <laughs> who is now uh, measuring the same proxy, the very strong cooling proxy on this side here. Uh, this is another side that is uh, taken very close to our side. So it's called U1429. Yep. And uh, it seems that uh, it, here at the side doesn't show as strong cooling as the one from this side here, even though they're really close by to each other. So okay. our approach to uh, tackle this is like, to, uh, to look at a few replicate cores from nearby sites to see whether or not this is a real signal for this region or just that one side that is a little bit uh, strange. Yeah. yeah. And and an associated question in the models that you're running, do you have a realistic bathymetry around this area? Because it's very complex, but it's gonna have a huge influence on uh, temperature records that you get from that area. Mm. So you're talking you about uh, I don't actually know uh, about that. Perhaps uh, if is Winler here, maybe he can uh, try to answer that because the bathymetry of the ocean. Just because you're in quite coastal sites. So I'm just yeah. wondering, just something yeah. to think about. Maybe it could have an influence, maybe not. I, I'm not sure, but um, it, it it's in a very kind of specific area. Anyway, it's, it's, um, Thank you very much for your talk. I enjoyed it. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Liang And uh, we'll move on to the next speaker. Um, Professor Zhongxi Zhang from China, University of Geosciences, will talk uh, on the influence of global mean sea level rise on atmospheric and oceanic circulations. 
please, John C. Yeah. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes, I do. Yeah. Okay. So I close my camera to make sure the internet connection is good. Okay. So next, I will present the influence of global mean uh, sea level rise on climate. Uh, globe, yeah, global mean sea level sea level uh, sea level has risen in an accelerated rate in the recent decades, and according to IPCC report, it is uh, it is virtually certain that sea level will continue to rise in the near future. Scientific community has paid a lot of attention to the sea level rise. Uh, this study published in Nature uh, 2020 summarized the observed sea level rise in the last century, the blue line here, and distinguished the contributors to the sea level rise. In general speaking, ocean thermonic, uh, oceanic thermal expansion, uh, ice mass loss, and the changes in terrestrial water storage cause the global mean sea level rise. Oops, it doesn't move. Uh, sorry, there's something happened with my computer. It doesn't move. Uh, do you see my screen move? Hello? I can see the screen and I can hear. Uh, does it move? Uh, no, it's not moving. Okay, I stopped sharing my screen. Uh... Then I share it again. It is strange. Uh, it is quite strange with my computer. Okay, then I use this way. Audio Zoom Reunion. Zhongxi a arrêté le partage. Sorry. I'm sorry about my computer. Can you see my screen now? Yes. Uh, but I do not know if I can move it. It seems my computer doesn't work now. It is quite strange. Uh, I need to restart my computer. Wait a moment. Sorry. Okay. You could talk about data. There was um, there was a meeting, a PMIP working group uh, meeting um, last week. It was, and we were talking about how um, data should be organised in um, forthcoming PMIPs. And so, so I thought it was very interesting what um, what the last speaker was saying, and whether she wants to um, say more about it, about how she might. 
I mean, we were sort of discussing we might have a group of people because I think Sandy Harrison is, is doing a bit less or I'm not sure exactly, but um, there's sort of space for development of data model comparison and things like that. And I was interested that you're looking at both the Pliocene and the LGM. So, yeah. you know, <laughs> I was thinking we could put her name forward. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, sorry, go, go. Uh, no, I said, yeah, it would be really great. I mean, um, so what, what is the, the angle of that? Is just to uh, compile more data or think about how to uh, screen data for data model comparison? Well, everything. Everything. <laughs> yeah. I mean, because, you know, there's this whole data world and then there's the model world. And of course, the data person wants a reliable product Hello? that they can use to compare to. Anyways, okay. But yeah, happy to contribute if I can. Yeah. So yes, sorry, Chris, you were saying. Screen, Hello, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, oh, I, I can hear you, Jiangxi. Do you want to try sharing your screen? Yes, uh, but uh, I'm not allowed to share my screen. Yeah, I, I gave permission right now. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I was going to say there was also at one point discussion okay. of, uh, of a proxy system model into comparison as well. Uh, but I can't actually remember who was interested in that. It was part of uh, the the data assimilation group that were doing things. But perhaps if Zhongxi's up and running, he can go back to his presentation and I'll step back. Okay. Okay, let me continue. Uh, sorry about my computer. Um, uh, this study published in Nature 2020 uh, summarized the, uh, the observed uh, sea level rise in the last century, ocean thermal expansion ice mass loss, and change in terrestrial water storage caused the global mean sea level rise. And before 1990, the rate of sea level rise remains below 3 millimeter per year but after it goes beyond. And compared to the beginning of 20th century, today global mean sea level is about 20 meter higher, uh, higher. In the near future, according to IPCC report, at the end of this year, uh, at the end of this century, global mean sea level is projected to rise by 28 to 55 centimeters on the SSP 11.9 scenario and 63 to 101 centimeters under the SSP 58.5 scenario relatively to the mean between 1995 and 2014. In a low likelihood, sea level can rise up to about five meters by 2150. Sea level rise is a frequent topic of discussion in scientific literature and public media, since it is a major factor contributing to coast hazards and risks. However, on a global scale, it is difficult to observe or investigate its climate impact, since the current sea level rise happens in a short time scale and remains small in centimeters the signal and the noise ratio is quite low. Paleoclimate provides unique opportunities to understand the uh, impact of sea level rise, sea level change. There are many past warm periods, sea level was much higher. IPCC report give us a few examples. The mid and warm period, sea level was about 5 to 25 meters higher. And marine ice top stage 11, about 400,000 years ago, sea level was about 6 to 13 meters higher. During the interglacial period, the high peak sea level stand was about 5 to 10 meters higher. And IPCC report doesn't exclude the possibility of a, of a high sea level during the middle Holocene. Of course, during the glacier period, sea level was much lower. For example, last glacier maximum about uh, 21,000 years ago 
sea level was about 120 meters lower than today. But in paleoclimate modeling, to reduce modeling complexity and difficulty, quite often paleoclimate modeling neglects or simplifies the changes in ocean bathymetry or ocean volume. One typical example is the ARGM simulation. Uh, in this glacial period, due to the drop of sea level, the difference between, in ocean uh, volume between ARGM and the pre-industrial should be four units. But in this table, you can see here, there are 14 models. Eight of them do not change the ocean volume or underestimate the ocean volume. When we simulate past warm climate, for example, mid Pleistocene and, and the last interglacial, quite often we do not change ocean bathymetry or ocean volume. When sea level rise can lift the reference surface between bathymetry and the temperature, modify land sea distributions, and also influence relative sea levels due to fresh water input. However, our model in the current generation have limited skill in representing this process. For example, atmosphere model often assume that ocean surface is flat under the atmosphere and limited by the model resolution. When sea level rise is small in centimeters, global model cannot represent change in coastal regions. There is no change in the land sea masks. When fresh water enters ocean, some models can simulate the adjustment in ocean volume due to the change of salinity and temperature, but cannot simulate the increase of ocean volume due to the added fresh water. To investigate the climate impact of sea level rise with our model, we need a simplified modeling skill to rise sea level spatially and uniformly. Here, we carry out last interglacial experiment, and we also consider the sea level rise of five meters and 10 meters. We add a number uh, in the ocean bathymetry and reduce the same amount in the land topography. In the next step, we carry out present day experiment with an atmosphere CO2 level fixed at 400. We consider sea level rise of 62.5 centimeters to 20 meters. There is a long lasting problem in the last interglacial simulations. The model data miss much in the southern hemisphere. The multimodal ensemble mean, the multimodal ensemble mean from the PMAP last interglacial experiment show a weak warming or cooling in the southern hemisphere mid and high latitudes. This simulation compared to these reconstructions is much smaller. Our last interglacial experiment with Norwegian Earth System model forced only with orbital forcing and greenhouse gas levels shows a cooling in the southern hemisphere. This result is not surprising since we know that that last interglacial uh, Earth's orbital configuration reduce insulation in the southern hemisphere. However, once we include sea level rise in our experiment, our, uh, our model simulates a strong warming relative to the pre-industrial around Antarctica in the middle latitude of southern hemisphere, thus reducing the model data mismatch. The key mechanism behind this simulated warming is a wind change. There is easterlies anomalies, easterly anomalies appear in the mid-latitude of southern hemisphere. 
In our experiment, the sea level rise lowers topography and deepens bathymetry. It causes responses in surface pressure, increase on land, decrease on ocean. Then, when calculating two sea level pressure, positive anomalies appear over Antarctica. Following the geostrophy wind theory, is the anomalies should appear in the mid-latitude of southern hemisphere. The wind change leads to ocean feedback, for example, weakened southern ocean ventilation. Thus, we can find enhanced polar world ocean heat transport in the southern hemisphere, thus strong warming in the southern hemisphere mid and high latitudes. The reduced model data mismatch indicates that our model and the modeling skier by increasing sea level, especially uniformly, do a good job. Then we use this method, this modeling skier, in the present day experiment, but the present day experiment give us more complicated model behavior. The sea level rise lowers topography and deepens bathymetry. Yes, it leads to response in surface pressure, uh, increase on land, decrease on ocean. However, when calculating to sea level pressure, negative anomalies appear over Antarctica. Following the theory, westerlies, uh, westerly anomalies should appear in the mid latitude of Southern Ocean. The wind change leads to ocean feedback. For example, intensified uh, ventilation in Southern Ocean, then we can find reduced polar world ocean heat transport in the Southern Hemisphere, then at least some regional warming. I just don't see the so see on the list of passes, but maybe offline. Let's wait for the moment, maybe. It's not going well for him. The technology is not really helping him. <laughs> Hmm. I think he's back online. Yeah. I don't hear the sound. Hello, where should I start? Yeah, I think. <laughs> oh, dear. The, the wind change or I'm, I'm so sorry about the internet connection. I do not know what happened here. Uh, sometimes it is strange. Yeah, I think you uh, have a slide 14, probably. 14, OK. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. One, one next one, maybe? So, yeah, next one. So when we increase, uh, when we, the uh, when the sea level, uh, sea level rise is included in the simulation, 
the modal data mismatch is reduced. The key mechanism behind this simulated warming is wind change. Easterly ano anomalies appear in the mid latitude of southern hemisphere. In our experiment, the sea level rise lowers topography and deepens bathymetry. It leads to changes in surface pressure, increase on land, but decrease on ocean. When we calculate into sea level pressure, Positive anomalies appear over Antarctica, a following geostrophy wind theory. Easterly anomalies should appear in the mid latitude of Southern Hemisphere. Wind changes lead to ocean feedback, such as weakened Southern Ocean ventilation. Thus, we can find enhanced polar world ocean heat transport in the Southern Hemisphere thus a very strong warming in the southern hemisphere mid high latitude. The reduced model data mismatch indicates that our model and the modeling skier uh, increase in sea level spatially uniformly do a good job. Thus we use this modeling skier in the present day experiment, but the model give us more complicated behavior. The same amount of sea level rise, lawyers, topography, and the deep spectrometry. Then it, uh, it changes the surface pressure, increase on land, decrease on ocean. But when we calculate the two sea level pressure, negative anomalies appear over Antarctica. Following the theory, westlies Westerly anomalies appear in the mid latitude of southern hemisphere, leads to ocean feedback, such as regional intensified southern ocean ventilation. Then we can find reduced ocean polar world ocean heat transport in the southern hemisphere. Thus, at least some regional cooling in the southern ocean, in particular in the India and the Pacific side. Although present day experiment show complicated response in atmosphere and ocean circulations. However, when we put them together, we do find some common features. First, sea level rise tends to cause a positive feedback. With sea level rise, we can see that the global mean surface air temperature increase, but this increased trend is not significant, but the increasing trend in the land mean surface air temperature is significant. Second, sea level rise cause a north and a south temperature dipole in the Pacific side with a strong warming in the North Pacific. This temperature dipole is evident even when sea level rise is very small in centimeters and this dipole strengths with the further growth of sea level. The simulated warming in the North Pacific is related to the enhanced ocean heat transport in the North Pacific when sea level rise. So, uh, the, uh, third, sea level rise tends to weaken AMOC, uh, but the impact is non-linearly. The sea level rise of five meters seems to be a threshold. With sea level rise, we can find that net water flux through the Berlin Strait is increasing. That means the sea level rise allows more Pacific water flow into the Arctic. However, when the sea level rise is less than five meters, the increased Pacific water inflow has a small influence in the North Atlantic and the Labrador Sea. Thus, we do not find very strong changes in sea surface salinity in this region. But when the sea level rise is larger than five meters, the increased Pacific water inflow has a much strong 
influence in the North Atlantic and the Labrado Sea. We can see a large drop in the sea surface salinity in these regions, thus leading to a weakening of AMOC. Anyway, our experiments demonstrate that a small global mean sea level rise, even in tens of centimeters, is large enough to generate significant global climate responses, particularly at mid and high latitudes. Has the recent sea level rise imprinted the global climate? It remains difficult and earlier to answer this question, although we find some signal similar to our simulation. The important observation comes from the Berlin Strait. The yellow line here for the site A2, the black line here for the site A3, the northward water transport, we can, increase, we can see an increasing trend in this record. The net northward flow through the Berlin Strait is increasing at a rate of 0.01 spread drop per year from 1990 to 2019. However, we cannot attribute this increasing trend to sea level rise because maybe this increasing trend is just due to a decadal variability. We also calculate the SST trend uh, between 1970 and 2020. From these two boxes, one box in the North Pacific and another one in the Southern Ocean of Pacific side. Red line here for the North Pacific, we can see an increasing trend. And the blue line here for the Southern Ocean in the Pacific side, we can see a decreasing trend. There is opposite changes in these two boxes, but maybe the cooling trend in the Southern Ocean of Pacific side is due to the orbital variability. Anyway, our experiment demonstrates that considering global mean sea level change is important in modeling paleoclimate, particularly past warm climate, and consider sea level variation can potentially resolve model data mismatch and debates in understanding paleoclimate evolution. Global mean sea level tends to, uh, tends to result in positive feedback in the climate system though the impact of sea level change depends on background climate and is complex and long linear. The present day experiment suggests that the effect of sea level rise on the global climate will become non-negligible in the near future. A slight, spatially uniform uplift in sea level is enough to change atmospheric and oceanic circulation and heat transport. The Southern Ocean and the Berlin Strait appear to be crucial region to detect the impact of sea level rise. Since the global mean sea level rise bring adjustment in large scale atmosphere and ocean circulation, actually both coast and inland countries are exposed to this change. In the future, we need to pay attention to these slow climate feedbacks such as sea level rise. That's my talk. Thanks for your attention. Thank you very much. It's important information. Both the experimental design for the PMIP community and also some impl implication for the future. Although uh, we passed the time that we promised, I would like to take a few questions if there are. Thanks. Any questions? Audio maintenant rétabli à l'heure. Massa? De Louis Saim. Just, just I, I, if there is no question, I, I may give some comments, I think, to this, to this study. First, as Dong Shi said, this is the result of only one model. I think. In the framework of uh, last integration, it could be very interesting to test other models' sensitivity to this to this point. 
This will be very important. Another thing is that, uh, of course, it is a, it is a crude special resolution uh, because it is global. So, of course, I think this is a, a, a limitation. Uh, but I think uh, this result um, is important for future climate because uh, as a function, not for, maybe not so much for the 21st century, whereas Songshi has shown that even some centimeters uh, produce a difference. But I think for the, for the, for the 200, for the, for the scale of, when 220, for the scale of century, it is really, I think, important because the, no the signal will be outside from the noise and we can see something. So I think uh, it could be interesting, as, as she said, to, to really try to investigate and to extract the noise from, from the signal and to be sure that uh, what we are seeing in the different places that he showed are related to these uh, changes in the GMSM. Thank you, Joe. Are there any questions? There are some comments on the chat as well. Um, if anybody wants to speak up. If there are not. Luis, do you want to? Uh, <laughs> I, I'm not sure how good my connection is at the moment, so I, I put a, a question in the chat. But it was just to say that was a really lovely, clear talk. Um, but I did have a question, just to ask if there'd been any interest in looking at the sea ice behaviour for those experiments. Um, it looks like there might be interesting differences in what's going in for the last interglacial and the future simulations for the sea ice. Um, I wondered if there was any comment on that. Do you can you speak? No, Jensi, I think you're on mute. Hi. Maybe, maybe you'll need to email him, Louise. <laughs> Yeah, about the role of the seas. Um, okay, I, I I'd like to close the 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 um today's pimi pwings because it's a good time, and thank you very much for participating until the end. And uh, thank you very much for the uh, speakers, Ling and Zonzi uh, especially, and uh, the participant. Okay. Uh, Do you know when the next one thought... is? Hmm. Do we know when the next one is? We we okay. do. It's uh, the twentieth of April. Okay. Uh, at a time that is five p.m. in London, and that's all I've worked out. But it's written on the website. Okay. As to when that is. I think it will be announced again. Yeah. Later. Yeah. I'll send out an email. Okay. Thank you. So we'll uh, close. So, bye bye. <laughs> Thank you very much, everybody. And thank you, Massa. Thank you.